Our next speaker is Mohamed Sonidi, a uh, speaker um, who is uh, Joseph Bernacki from Tennessee Technological University. Uh, the title of the talk is Printability Metrics for Additive Manufacturing of Cement-Based Materials. All right, folks. So um, this is the last talk. I'd like to point out that our, our broader group, we've been working for about five years together from Purdue University, Vanderbilt University, and uh, my group at Tennessee Tech, along with uh, folks at NIST now more, more recently. And uh, our group actually opened the session with Reza Moini's uh, talk, uh, the, was, was the first, very first talk, and now ours is the last talk. So we've been working on printability of cement-based paste on a small scale to try and understand some you know, very fundamental issues of uh, how printing actually works. So at Tennessee Tech, our work really involves three different aspects, something I call the strange rheology of cement-based paste. And this is primarily an experimental activity to look at the time-dependent rheological behavior of cement paste. We're also doing some computational work where we've developed something called a 2D stationary computational printing that takes the experimental rheological work, uh, incorporates, incorporates it into um, cost-effective, computationally cost-effective computational models to predict the printability of cement paste. And then finally, we're working on <clears throat> trying to identify um, new additives and maybe less conventional additives for use as printing aids in uh, cement printing effectively. And that's, that's primarily the topic of, of the talk today. So we've completed a four by four full factorial design where we've looked at three different printing aids, gel, gel forming polymer based printing aids. Um, and we varied the uh, percent of, um, of uh, polymer in the gel phase and we vary the gel to cement ratio where gel to cement ratio here replaces water to cement ratio effectively. And you can see with the naked eye without any, without any um, quantification that there are differences in the printability of, uh, of these model objects, which are um, the, the benchmark object is just a hollow cylinder. See, we have domains where we could not print domains of poor printability, for example, and domains of, of rather good printability. So our question really is for today's talk is how should we compare these two objects? The one on the left is the model or the target object and the one on the right, for example, is a printed object. Well, there are lots of ways to do this if you start searching the literature. And they really fall into two categories. There are qualitative methods and quantitative methods. And the qualitative methods are basically visual inspection methods or methods that augment visual inspection with some sort of microscopy. The quantitative methods typically use some sort of um, measurements or possibly laser scanners or even X-ray CT. The problem is, is that most all of these methods, and in general, all of these methods have some level of subjectivity. And furthermore, the way that they're reported in the literature and, and cases are kind of ambiguous, and we really don't fully understand what they've done. So we wanted to tear into this problem. So again, you know, how should we compare these objects? The problem really is, is once the printed object is removed from the printing stage, we're working on a, on a small scale, so our objects are actually done on a printing stage stage and we can handle the objects. At that point, all spatial, all spatial points of reference are lost and that's problematic. So what do people do? So let's take a look at a case study here. And we're just gonna look at a simple 2D, 2D object and ask how should we make the comparisons? What's generally done are some form of landmarks on the model object are selected. And then likewise, those landmarks are selected on the printed object, and then they have to be aligned somehow. It's the alignment that's actually the problem and, and offers the subjectivity. So for example, one, one way to align would say that the bases are collinear, or in this case, if it was 3Ds, it would be coparallel somehow. And we might align a single, ob a single point on the base then. We might also simply align the centers of mass of the two, keeping the bases parallel or we might minimize the distance between all of these uh, reference points or these landmarks. And that might involve the rotation of either the model or rotation of the, of the printed object. But nonetheless, all of these techniques are still somewhat subjective. So we're trying to remove the subjectivity at some level. And we have two techniques that we're working on 
uh, that we might suggest. One would be to um, align the base, keeping them keeping the base parallel or collinear or coplanar, uh, co and then um, align the axial centroidal moment of inertia. The second way would be to minimize, to, um, to align the minimum moment of inertia. And this would require, again, either a, um, a rotation of the model object or a rotation of the printed object. So we're going to take a look at both of these techniques. And in addition to that, um, we've taken a look at calculation of a surface-based index or fidelity of printability, we'll call it or looking at a volume-based method. The surface-based methods require some sort of point sampling where the volume-based methods require integration over the entire point clouds. So we're doing the same thing everybody else is doing when they do image processing. We've printed our object, we've done a CT scan, we take a look at the raw grayscale images to see what they're like, we may sharpen or adjust them at some point, and then we, we threshold and after thresholding, we binarize, we remove um, any artifacts that are caused by the XCT, like the bright spot in the middle, which is not part of the actual structure. And we have then a clean binary, which we stack and then generate our point cloud rendering from which we can do some calculations and do quantitative things. So there's a price for rotating. We said that in some of the cases or in some of the alignment techniques, you might have to rotate. If we don't rotate, for example, things become rather simple. If we want to calculate a boundary base or location of the surface relative to the, to the model object, all of the data sets slice by slice from the CT, all of them are, are within the same planes and we only require a 2D interpolation to find the surfaces. But if you rotate, you immediately need a 3D interpolation. And whether you rotate the um, model objects or whether you rotate the uh, actual, the point cloud of the actual printed object, now you're no longer in the same planes, but we can still locate the surfaces by um, 3D interpolation. To calculate the volume, however, um, to compare volumes of the printed object versus the model object becomes somewhat more difficult. And after you rotate either the um, printed object or the model object, and it turns out that rotating the model object is simpler if, it's a, if it has a, a regular geometry. So in our case, it's a simple cylinder. It has a regular geometry. So we rotate the model object until the moment of inertia of the model object and the printed object minimum moments of inertia are aligned. And then we analytically determine um, the points along the uh, surface of the model object, which lie in the same plane as the printed object. And we can do then volume-based comparisons as well. That said, there are other challenges. So when you're measuring a boundary-based fidelity, the question is, is where is the surface, right? Where is that outermost boundary? There are inner porosity, which is not, could be inner porosity, which is not percolated to the surface. There could be horizontal discontinuities. Those discontinuities can actually pass in completely through the surface of the, of the object. There are also um, concave features, which are like this large cavern inside the object, um, which you, know, you have to do something with. So in a simple sense, what we do is simply identify the innermost surface and the outermost surface of the, of the printed object and compare that to the innermost surface and outermost surface of the model object to determine um, uh, surface-based or what we call boundary-based fidelity. So to make this happen, and in this case, if, for example, we were to align the um, uh, centroidal uh, axial moment of inertia, we binarize the image, we locate where the surfaces are, we superimpose the model on the actual um, surface, uh, we then align the axial uh, centroidal moments of inertia, and we run n, n random points to the surface and calculate, do point matching and compute then a printability, what we call here a boundary-based printability index or a fidelity um, according to what, where the boundary is. So in this case, we penalize for deviations in the uh, inner and outer surfaces. We sum the squares. We divide by uh, the number of points actually um, uh, sampled. And we subtract that from one to make the printability uh, index 
uh, vary from zero to one, where zero is a, a couldn't be printed object and one is the perfect object which printed perfectly. If we calculate a volume-based index, uh, on the other hand, instead of instead of comparing points on the surface or deviations for points on the surface, we actually compare how well um, overlain is the printed structure with the structure that we actually desired to print or the model object. And we penalize for what's called positive volume, that is volume that was printed outside of the structure and, and negative volume, which is a volume or porosity where it was supposed to be printed, but no matter actually printed there, we sum those two, subtract it from one. And then we multiply it by a Boolean operator such that it forces the printability index based on a volume or the volume-based fidelity to also vary between zero and one. So let's take a look at sampling statistics because it turns out that if you're doing surface-based characterizations, you have to um, sample a number of points. So I've compared two objects. This top object is, is an object that has quite a bit of internal structure. It also has vis visibly is distorted. And in fact, its axis of minimum moment of inertia lies quite a bit outside of the plane of the axis of minimum moment of inertia for the model object. Whereas this object, which visibly looks good, it also has very little internal structure, its axis of minimum moment inertia is almost ideally in the plane of the axis of minimum moment of inertia of the model object. So we sampled n sample points m times such that n times m is a constant and we plotted as n increases, we plotted the standard deviation and the mean value of the printability index or the fidelity uh, as a function of the number of points sampled. And when this uh, graph collapses to roughly a stable standard deviation, then you, you have a number that might be a reasonable number of sample points to, to, to actually quantify where the surface location is. And in this case, it's about a thousand. That collapses a little faster for the well-printed object. And you also notice it collapses to a smaller standard deviation. So if you sample about a thousand points, you're good to go. You can also use the standard deviation as a, um, secondary measure of uh, merit um, for printability, and it gives you some information about the quality of the print surface. Another way of looking at this, however, which we found to be interesting was to compare the location of the surface, a histogram of location of the surface for the inner and the outer surface, compare the histogram for the actual printed object versus the model object, and do that if you don't rotate, that is if you align only the uh, centroidal axis of moment of inertia versus if you um, align the minimum axis of moment of inertia. So you see in the case where the axis of minimum moment of inertia are not well aligned, when you do align them, you find that the mass is all over the place. And that as a matter of fact, it's a very poor print. Whereas for this object where the axis of minimum moment of inertia aligns well with that of the model, the printed object and the model object, you see that rotation has very little effect on where the mass is, uh, where the surfaces are actually located. So the question is to rotate or not to rotate. And so this graph, I think, brings the answer home. So if you do not rotate, and in, in this case, we took a population of our, of our printed samples and we applied the technique which aligns the um, axial centroidal moments of inertia versus aligning the minimum moments of inertia. And we plotted that as a function of the angle between the minimum moments of inertia and what you basically see as you would expect in the first case where the uh, axial centroidal moments are aligned, it's not a function of the minimum moment of inertia, the angle between the minimum moments of inertia. But as soon as we align the minimum moments of inertia, it, it it really penalizes boundary-based um, fidelity and in fact gives you a very strong indication of which it discriminates. It's a, it's a much stronger discriminator um, between which objects are well printed and which objects are not well printed. That being said, we can begin to use this information to uh, look at quantitative differences in printability. And in this case, we're looking now at a comparison of our three printing aids, and we can see clear differences now between, for example, hydroxyethyl methyl cellulose and hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose and a polyethylene oxide with the hydroxyethyl methyl cellulose being a, a, having a clearly improved um, uh, 
print fidelities. As the, as the eye would suggest, now we have very good quantitative information on that. We can look at this in a different way. We could take the qualitative information, now quantify it using one of our indices. And in this case, we have bar graphs. And in this case, we have a surface plot. But in addition, we could now begin to use such quantitative information then to superimpose and superimpose on top of it, rheological information, where in this case, we're using the, um, the storage modulus of the neat gel and the storage modulus of the paste made from those gels. And what we find is that as the storage modulus of the neat gel increases, the storage modulus of the paste made for them actually decreases. And it turns out that when we superimpose it in this kind of juxtaposition, we can actually begin to see uh, domains of um, rheological preference for, our, for the rheology of our paste um, in accordance with um, preference or preferred or better printability. So finally, and in conclusion, um, not all printability indices are created equally. Um, all of them really require some form of alignment. Um, some of them will require rotation. Some of them have a, a higher degree or lesser degree bias, that is um, a subjectivity. And some uh, also penalize better for internal defects. In addition, you may have to do 2D or 3D interpolations. Um, you'll need internal structure if you want to use these types of techniques. And in some cases, you'll have to be cognizant of sampling statistics. So uh, my final slide here is just to uh, show that we have a, some of the work here is um, uh, based on a recent paper by my graduate student, Hajir Tahiri, and I uh, want to thank uh, some of our other co-authors, Ed Garbozzi uh, at NIST and my colleague, uh, Will Carroll at, uh, at Tennessee Tech. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Joe. Uh, do we have any questions? All right, and I'm not. Oh, I'll ask a question. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Joe. It was very nice, very interesting talk. So I was just kind of curious if you went ahead and ranked like some prints uh, using your quant whatever quantitative measure you wanted to use or pick, and compared that to uh, like uh, like say the visual one. How do they correlate? Like yes, this? we're. That's a good question, Nick. We're actually doing that. And in some cases, there, there are pretty good correlations, and in other cases, um, not as good, right? Because, you know, if we were to correlate, you know, a, a part like this necessarily, you might find out that this thing has an axis of minimum moment of inertia that is well out of alignment, and it looks like a great print. So, um, but in reality, if it's moments of inertia don't align, then effectively it's saying that the matter is not placed where you would expect it to be placed, then there's probably internal defects or there's some sort of um, distortion of the external object that the eye really doesn't respond to. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, I think, you know, we do have some, there is sometimes you get correlation and sometimes you don't. The key is if you don't include internal structure, then you, you, you really don't have a very good quantitative measure of whether or not you've really placed the material where you expect it to place it. And you could be fooled with a very good object like that. Right. No, very good. Right, thank you. Yeah. yeah. For instance, I was wondering if you were trying to do quality control and, you know, you're making uh, like multiple objects that are the same shape. You want to make sure everybody's okay. So you might use yeah. these methods to, uh, yeah. you know, to yeah. assess that. Yeah. Yes, you could do that. If, if you had objects that you could quantify the internal structure somehow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, we have an, uh, another question. Um, was the HMEC uh, low molecular weight or high molecular weight? Yeah, that's a very good question. I don't actually know the answer to that question. We've asked that several times and um, our supplier doesn't actually tell us, but we, we were planning on making some measurements in our own lab of the molecular weight, you know, indirect measurements of molecular weight using viscosities or something like that. Yeah, but we don't, we don't know the molecular weight offhand. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> That's frustrating when you can't get information like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, but that's a very, it is a very, that's a very, very good. And it's a very relevant question. Yeah. You know, because not all gels are created equal either. And we know, we know that because polyethylene oxide, for example, produces a really beautiful gel, but unfortunately polyethylene oxide, at least the formulations that we've used has not produced a, a very, you know, it's not, a, it's not nearly as printable, at least 
in this design, you know? Hmm. So yeah, good question. Hmm. All right, I think with that, uh, we'll end. Uh, thank Joe again, thank you very much. Um,